Buenos días, buenas tardes, bonjour, bonsoir, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to Governance Capacity Development Session Series for Strengthening Public Governance and Accelerating Innovation to Achieve Agenda 2030. This series is jointly organized and delivered by UN Project Office on Governance and the Global Research and Development Business Center of Seoul National University. I am John Song, serving as Deputy Director of Global Research and Development Business Center, and I am deeply honored to serve as the moderator of this opening session, which starts today, will run, will run until June 25. In this age of big global transformation, we need to strengthen our global solidarity of hope with a spirit of oneness to move forward climate resilient, sustainable, inclusive, and healthy societies. We need to think, act, and run a race to move toward a much better tomorrow for the whole global people, leaving no one behind in the darkness. But this race can't be won without being properly founded on and informed by essential principles to map the clear direction we need to run to. This session series will provide a vivid map for you to come together and run together. Through this series, I wish you can find answers to the questions of what are the principles of effective governance for sustainable development? And how can the principles be transformed as a good benchmarking for strengthening public institutions? And why is SDG 16 an accelerator for the entire 2030 agenda? To open and celebrate this series, I would like to invite two leaders of both institutes to give you opening remarks. The first opening remark will be given by Mr. Bogyun Shim. Mr. Bogyun Shim is head of office of the United Nations Project Office on Governance under the Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government, UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. Since his inauguration in March 2020, he has been dedicated to contributing to strengthening public administration capacities in developing member states to advance the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Prior to joining the United Nations, Mr. Shim was Vice Minister of the Interior and Safety of the Government of the Republic of Korea. And Mr. Shim also held various senior positions, including Vice Governor for Administrative Affairs of Jeonbuk Province, Assistant Minister for Planning and Coordination of the Ministry of the Interior and Safety and the Ministry of Gender Equality and Family, as well as Chair Professor at the Korean National Open University. Everyone, please join me to welcome Mr. Shim. Thank you, Professor Song, for your nice words. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. Good evening, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the Governance Capacity Development Session Series, Strengthening Public Governance and Accelerating Innovation to Achieve Agenda 2030 for Implementation of Sustainable Development. Co-organized by the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, UNDESA, Division for Public Institutions and Digital Government, DPIDG, through its Project Office on Governance, UNPOG, and the Global Research and Development Business Center of Seoul National University, SNUGRC. Taking this occasion, I would like to express my deep appreciation to Honorable Professor Junzok Pang, SNU colleagues and my colleagues for their hard work to make this series possible. 
we are still facing extreme challenges with the COVID-19 affecting our societies to their core. The pandemic has exposed institutional weaknesses and government's difficulties in limiting its negative impact. Yet, in many others, it has underscored the strong will to adapt through innovation and commitment to working together through strengthened partnerships. However, the pandemic is not over yet, and the full extent of its impact is still unknown. As we emerge from this crisis and build our societies back together, governments have the opportunity to accelerate actions to achieve the SDGs by 2030. It is critical to strengthening public governance and accelerating innovation to overcome policy silos, strengthen institutional coordination across sectors, engage key stakeholders, and coordinate actions at all levels to mainstream risk-informed governance strategies for more sustainable and resilient recovery. The pandemic has not only put an incredible strain on our healthcare systems, it has also affected public institutions' ability to manage this crisis in education, employment, food security, and poverty reduction. Furthermore, it is a setback for the SDG's achievement, let alone the call for acceleration. It is also important member states leverage new approaches and innovation, including using ICTs. Digital government has played a significant role in responding to the pandemic. Many good practices, innovative measures, and the lessons learned have emerged. ICT tools and the digital government will continue to be critical in the recovery process and build a resilient future. However, more efforts are needed for genuine digital government transformation, such as better digital access, ICT infrastructure investment, agile digital policy frameworks, comprehensive cybersecurity policies, and adequate digital literacy and skills. While the focus and many resources have been shifted towards containing the pandemic, we should think of recovery and SDG implementation as a holistic process to create a synergetic impact. Recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic in a sustainable and resilient manner will require integrated policies and approaches based on whole of government and whole of a society approaches. This is also true for accelerating the implementation. Sustainable and resilient recovery does not need to negate the effort of the SDG acceleration. It should be the catalyst for further change. We'll try to address several main themes during this governance capacity development session series, such as the 2030 Agenda and the SDG 16, Smart City Development, Digital Transformation, and the Digital Transformation and ESG, Data Governance, Public-Private People Partnership, Public Governance for Social Inclusion, Risk-Informed Governance, and Fostering Startups for SDGs. I trust that if we all put our strengths, we will be able to achieve the SDGs successfully. We'll be conducting 10 sessions this semester, including today's session, but I believe it, it won't end there. This is because I believe that the participants here will play an important part in your respective positions for the advancement of SDGs after your graduation or return to your respective duty stations. I'm excited to collaborate with SNU Global Research Development Business Center for this governance capacity development session series, because I believe it has several implications. First, the participants in this area, series of sessions will play a dedicated role in their respective countries upon graduation. Second, as the participants of this course will be continuously recruited, there is a hope that this session series is not a one-time event, but can develop into a sustainable platform for the implementation of SDGs. 
Third, because it is a session that is held in academia, I trust that the participants will tap into scientific analysis and come up with creative suggestions for the advancement of SDGs through research activities. I strongly hope this governance capacity development session series can provide a common knowledge base to discuss and share general knowledge on the framework of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the critical importance of strengthening public governance and building effective, accountable, transparent institutions at all levels for SDG implementation. In particular, I am confident in a hopeful future and a bright world while looking at young audience of full of youthful energy, brilliant ideas, and a strong commitment to SDGs. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to strengthen public governance during this extraordinary times, respond to new local realities and advance more resilient and sustainable solutions. I look forward to insightful discussions and your active participation throughout the series. Once again, thank you to the esteemed head of the SNUGRC, Jun Zhe Huang, for his first co-organization of the session series. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Mr. Shin, for your inspirational, welcoming remark. Now we have another good leader from Seoul National University, Dr. Jun Seo Huang. Dr. Jun Seo Huang is a professor of technology management, economics, and policy program in the College of Engineering. And he holds very many important positions at Seoul National University that include director of Seoul National University Global R&D Center, and Director of Transdisciplinary Graduate Program in Smart City Global Convergence. Dr. Huang is leading various meaningful initiatives on green smart digital transformation of cities, business ecosystems, and global societies with energy, passion, and vision to actively implement the goals and objectives of sustainable development goals. Please join me to welcome Dr. Han. Thank you, Professor Song, and also thank you, Mr. Shin, uh, for your uh, great introduction and uh, appreciation for the uh, today's session series and preparation of our global r and Center. Um, first of all, uh, I really like to uh, appreciate uh, all the participants, especially the participants who are here. Uh, at least I, uh, because of the pandemic, I see that, you know, almost 20 people, you know, we limit the people. But as you can see on the board, you now we have a, more than 110 or, you know, it's keep increasing. So already we have a more than 120 or, you know, 30 people. Um, thanks to the, the great uh, progress of internet and also thanks to the pandemic, which accelerate the digital transformation. Um, I'd like to actually give, uh, you know, two messages, one in relation to the names of our organization, you know, who are uh, presenting uh, today and preparing uh, these uh, session series. The second one message I'd like to represent is, you know, what uh, SDG goal that we try to achieve, you know, and especially we focus. So let me start with the first one. Uh, we have a two organization who have been united for last two years, I would say. But finally, we come up with a certain activity we can do together as a corporation. Those two organizations are represented by very famous name, two names. One is the name of the name of UN, United Nations, and the other famous name is Seoul National University. Both of the organizations are well known in the world and in, the, in Korea. 
because of the name well known, what we say is reputation. And all of both of the organizations have been built the reputation globally and nationally. I'd like to share with you, you know, how such reputation has been come through in today's society in our generation. Reputation are representative uh, and integrity value of many goodnesses. First, diligence. Second, trust. Third, responsibility. Fourth, excellency. And fifth, communities or unitedness. I want you to see, you know, what's common in these names. It's a nation. What, what is the meaning of nation? It's a symbol of unity of people and civilians and individual to be united for the value of one community, pursuing certain vision and sharing the history and try to improve the society and value of the society and the society a collection of the people. I believe our name are very honorable, United Nations and Seoul National University, who are representing the, the value of nation. I believe many leaders and many, you know, our ancestors, many seniors of our nation have been actually tried to improve the values of the nation. And probably we wanna improve our understanding of nation by the internet. You know, the nation represented by the digital world, nation represented by the, you know, the data, because you still can share the common value as a global community. Maybe, uh, you know, the value of what we are doing by our name, United Nations and Seoul National University. Probably this is our one of the common and corporate activity to improve the understanding of value of nation. And then we have a responsibility to make the nation into the different paradigm of the stage, which can be sustainable against any part of the uncertain risk, such as pandemic. I hope during you know, this coming 10 weeks, all of us who are attending these you know, ceremony or these you know, sessions can be strengthened to work for the nation which is the nation that you are currently living, but also you, uh, you know, which is the nation you want to make in the future for yourself and for your next generation. We'll do our best to make our effort can be contributed to, to, to any of the nation that who want to remind us that nations are together with the citizens and with all the people. That's first message about the nation from our name for organizing these very special sessions with United Nations and Seoul National University. The second message I'd like to share with you is about the SDG, the numbers we are representing. As you know, there are 17 goals in our SDG, which are, we already spent five years and 10 years left. And we wanna go back and see whether we, 
we already have checked also how much we achieved. If we have a goal, then you know, then you need to have an evaluation, you need to have assessment, how much you know you progress. Have we done about our assessment, about the goals? And there are 17 goals. And then those 17 goals are individually you know, assessed and reminded. And we have, did, did we have a collective effort as a nation? Maybe, maybe not. So one third already passed of, out of 15 years, the 10 years left. Our next 10 week session series will represent 10 years of our commitment until 2030. And we want to focus on this session series on two very important goals, which are very underlined on the value of nation, on the value of community. The first, the goal we are representing is number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Reminding you of my message was about the nation. City is the small set and compact sample of the nation. City has a government, municipality, city has a tax, city has a responsibility to provide all the infrastructure that your society need, right? And we have a city as a nation. Yes, city was built before the nation. Then, you know, the founded city became the capital. And finally, you have a federated government or federated nation. Yes, our city really represents some of the community we want to make it more sustainable. In what way we are not sustainable in nation and the cities? Many ways, environmental, social, governance, economically, environmentally. How we can overcome such problem? That's up to us. But many of our you know, progressive effort require innovation and effort and technology, so-called smart city and certain other digital transformation. Our cooperation between UN and SNU, especially UN Park and our SNU GRC, represent such kind of complement value of technical innovation and governance innovation. For that reason, that different profession are gathering together, but we will achieve the same goals together. The second goal we will be dealing with and for the next another in a 10 weeks is SDG 16. SDG 16 represents, you know, very important governance issues, what we so-called peace, justice, and strong institution. Well, we are, our community and our inner cities, our nations are threatened by many segregation, discrimination, conflict. We are losing peace. We want to recover the peace. We want our peace better than before. Our justice has been also weakened by many other values. But our heart are still with such justice. But the environment we are living are not in that way. Certainly, we want to accomplish such kind of values then we need to get together. How can we make these things possible as a community? 
That's why we need strong institution. Institution is something called organization, something called the center, something called many forms of organization, which represent the people, the community of practice where people are coming together and working together and united together to achieve that same goal and purposes and objectives. That is institution. That is different from the city. That is different from the community. Institution has a values which we want to have a same common objective. We should create the goal and we should be united to achieve that goal. Then these strong institutions need to be represented with inclusive institution, innovative institution, and trustable and reliable and transparent institution finally open institution. I believe the effort we are making, the UN part and SNUGRC are one of the pioneering activities and institution we want to create as a virtual organization through these very important session series. I hope you keep stay tuned and participating and joining in this very important institution building. Again, I really thank you all the participants. I'd like to recognize some of the main group, all the SNU students and professors, and also all the SDP students and members, and also all the our partner organization and ITPP alumni in the world. I greatly appreciate your participation. I hope you enjoy the, all the session and engaged, finally strengthened to be the leader of that strong institution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ha, for your insightful and very inviting welcoming speech. As you can see, we have already over 107 participants over online. We have 10 brilliantly looking uh, people here attending on site, 10 of them already. So we are forming a great family already who can achieve the 17 SDG goals in the near future. As well, another very important announcement, which is about your certification. You will get certification after this whole series of 10 uh, sessions, but you need to attend at least eight lectures or sessions with the 75 attendance of each session. So if you fall asleep through those sessions, it's a little bit allowed, but you have to be awake at least 75% for each session. So please 
keep our enthusiasm and interest through these sessions. Now I'm really happy to introduce you the first speaker who is actually Mr. Bogyun Shim again. So let's welcome Mr. Shim with a large applause. Thank you again. Nice to meet you again. I will briefly talk about uh, uh, I'll briefly talk about sustainable development. Uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, and the principles of uh, effective governance for sustainable development and the curriculum uh, on governance. Uh, the world has changed uh, dramatically in the last two decades, but there are four shifts uh, that are particularly serious. Firstly, we are closer than ever uh, to eradicating extreme poverty. However, due to COVID-19, uh, the progress has been set back. Uh, but there is still, uh, we are uh, progressing toward the SDGs. Secondly, Human societies are causing more damage than ever to the planet and the environment. Thirdly, inequality among between countries is increasing. Uh, finally, governance is becoming more complex, especially with the growing influence of technology. As you see on the screen, for the extreme poverty, the total number amounts to around 700, over 700 million. Also, nearly two, over 200 million children are out of school. 49 countries have no laws protecting women from domestic violence. There are many challenges still remains. So we should pay attention to uh, understanding the sustainable development and the challenges to be overcome. Yeah, uh, what we e mean by sustainable development, it has been defined uh, in many ways, but the uh, most frequently quoted uh, definition is from uh, common, our common future, as also known as the uh, Brundtland uh, report. Uh, the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. There are three pillars on the right side you, you will see, economic growth and the social inclusion, finally environmental protection. These core elements should be harmonized. Without the harmony, we cannot attain sustainable development goals. Uh, this agenda is a plan of action for people, uh, planet, prosperity, and peace and partnerships. It also seeks to strengthen university, universal yeah. 
universe, uh, universe peace in larger freedom. Uh, we can attain the uh, uh, SDGs with all the countries and the stakeholders uh, partnership in the implementing this plan. Uh, in these goals and targets, we are setting out very uh, ambitious and transformational vision. We envisage a world free of poverty, hunger, disease, and want. And we envisage a world of universal respect for human rights and human dignity. The rule of law, justice, equality, and non-discrimination. We envisage a world in which every country enjoys sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth and decent work for all. Uh, the sustainable development goals with the 169 targets form the core of the 2030 agenda. The sustainable development goals are a bold universal agreement to end poverty and all its dimensions and craft an equal, just, and secure world for people, planet, and prosperity. We cannot hope for sustainable development without peace, stability, human rights, and effective governance based on the rule of law. The SDG 16 aims to promote peaceful, inclusive societies for sustainable development and uh, build effective, accountable, inclusive institutions at all levels. The five P's, people, planet, prosperity, peace, and partnership. The five P's capture the broad scope of the agenda. The main goals focus on the five P's. For example, people focus on the well-being of all people and poverty in all its forms everywhere. Planet is uh, focused on protection of the Earth's ecosystems. To ensure the availability of water and sanitation for all. Prosperity focused on is focused on continued economic and technological growth to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. And uh, peace focused on securing peace. Partnerships focused on improving international cooperation to revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. The proposed sustainable development goals field may contain not only one, but also multiple objectives each objective can be found in multiple SDGs. Let's look at, take a look at the several objectives. Improving policy coherence. The SDGs are cross-cutting issues. So vertically, horizontally, it should be ensured. The policy co coherence should be ensured. And also for uh, promoting Investment in sustainable development. We we should 
uh, finance on an unprecedented scale, new resources must be tapped, commitments must be measured and monitored. And uh, supporting inclusive growth and uh, well being, ensuring the planet's st stability is required, strengthening data and availab availability and capacity is needed, turning the ambition of the SDGs into reality will require robust data to capture progress and evidence to inform decision making. And uh, the facilitating follow-up and review is essential to incentivize action and learning around the 2030 agenda. Uh, how are the SDGs supposed to be implemented? All member states to develop, develop as soon as practicable, ambitious national responses to the overall implementation of this agenda. So they translated the SDGs into national development and su sustainable development strategies. And the uh, legislature, national parliaments, they should enact necessary legislation and uh, adopt and uh, support the bodies necessary for implementing the SDGs. And all the public institutions, governments, should work closely on implementation with the regional and the local authorities. How will the progress or lack of progress be monitored? Every year, voluntary national reviews at the UN is conducted. Uh, conducted. It is uh, encouraged to conduct uh, regular and inclusive reviews of progress at the national and the subnational levels, but they are country-led and country-driven. And, and the stakeholders, do you know this you? We, the people affected mostly by the need for these goals, must hold our government accountable to the SDGs. Let's take a look at the principles of effective governance. The Committee of Experts on Public Administration, they came up with the 11 principles of effective governance for sustainable development. July 2018 in New York, aimed to take, tackle precisely these features of governance to lucidly operation, uh, operationalize it so that everyone can find common ground when taking about, talking about the scope and the scale, and of course, how to integrate it organi organically into the implementation of the 2030 agenda so that no one is left behind. Why do, the, do we need these principles? Uh, yeah, the, uh, for the public sector, the SDGs remain a major challenge. Uh, to address this challenge concretely, the Committee of Experts on Public Administration has developed a set of principles. They provided the practical expert guidance to interested countries. These principles are linked to our commonly used strategies for operationalizing responsive and effective governance and to strengthen national and local governance capacities. How they can be of benefit, it can help, they can help interest countries build effective, accountable and inclusive institutions at all levels and support countries in operationalizing 
the institutional aspects of SDG 16. If we take a look at uh, effectiveness, competence means to have sufficient expertise, resources, and tools to deal with mandates under their authority. For sound policy making, it means public policies should be coherent with one another and founded on true or well established grounds in full accordance with the fact, evidence, and good sense. Collaboration, it means all sectors yeah, should work together and jointly with the non-state actors towards the same end, purpose, and effect. For the accountability, there are three elements, integrity, it means discharge their duty, official duties honestly, fairly, and in a manner consistent with the soundness of moral principle. Transparency means open, public institutions should be open and candid in their execution and uh, promote access to information, independent oversight, that is another element. And inclusive, for the inclusiveness, there are five elements, leaving no one behind, non-discrimination, participation, subsidiarity, international, generational equity. Subsidiarity means central authorities should perform only those tasks which cannot be performed effectively at a more intermediate or local level. Uh, next, uh, the principles uh, has identified 62 such strategies uh, next slide uh, uh, you can see the 62 uh, strategies uh, next slide next slide. yeah uh, what is governance? What is effective governance? If we take a look at the inside of governance, we can see many elements of the governance, people, policy, process, procedure, technology should be effectively, it should work. Uh, Why uh, does uh, governance uh, encompasses the system by which an organization is controlled and operates and the mechanisms by which it and its people are held to account? Why is effective governance so important? It uh, uh, can maintain and strengthen the trust of stakeholders and the citizens and provides a foundation for building high performing institutions. And also public organizations can respond to the constantly changing environment by taking advantage of technology. Yeah, technology has created a year of digital transformation Next, uh, yeah, key capacities needed to achieve the 2030 agenda for sustainable development. We can see the key capacities at the three levels, so-called the system level, organizational level, individual level. The instruments for priority setting and the collective decision making for the executive, support to an effective judiciary and the participatory mechanisms can be a, a effective measure at the system level. 
and for the organization level, establishment of effective networks, team, and the functional commitments, communities can be effective. And at the individual level, skills, knowledge, and competencies of the individual capacity should be secured. In the next page. Yeah, when take a look at, if you take a look at this picture, what's wrong with this picture? What's the problem? Can you find? <laughs> the cut should be on at the front, but it is reversed. So the cut cannot move fastly, fast. Uh, at the governance aspect, no matter how good a policy or system is, it may not work properly. In the field, if the institutional arrangements are not set in place, and the capacity of the officials to lead the system is not enough. No matter how good a country has put forward an idea and the policy, if the governance mechanism does not work effectively, it does make sense. Next. Yeah, if you look at the pictures, two pictures, which is the, in, the, in the middle, there is a red circle, which is, uh, the red circle, which is red circle is bigger? Yeah, you're right. There is the same size, but depending on the context, it looks differently. What is this? related to the governance, no matter how good the government, good policy government comes up with, it can be seen differently depending on the stakeholders, even within the government system. The local governments and public institutions, institutions can look at the same policies differently according their, to their respective positions. Next. Yeah, let's, uh, let me take an example. Advanced payments policy for state contracts. There is a case that our, uh, the government, national government encourages advanced payments up to 70% of the contract amount for construction, manufacturing, and service contracts. But in the front line, the front line officers, some of the front line officers refused to use the advanced payment system. They insist on payment after the completion of the work, work depending on the progress of the work. The national government, they inquire, encourage these advanced payments to vitalize the local economy, to circulate money very rapidly. But the frontline officers, yeah, uh, does not, sometimes does not like it. How can we coordinate this problem? Next. You know, like that, uh, there are many gaps between policy and reality. So there is the role of public officials and the missions of public officials should take a look at the reality. 
then they can respond in an agile manner and anticipatory manner. But we cannot wait for the perfect policy. In reality, every time it can pose challenges. So design thinking method should be applied. During the implementation process, they can be adjusted. Next. So there is, uh, we sh should focus on problem solving. To focus on problem solving, we should uh, go to the field and we should try, then we can learn lessons and we can adjust the reality problems. Yes. For the discussion of, on uh, frontier and local issues, there are comparison between two cities. These cities, the frontier line officials suffer from piles of workloads ap applications for current registration, but the CDB, they use the delegation system and entrustment system. So they trust the authority to the private sector. There is no piles of workload. This CTA has conflict between civil servants and cities. There is no conflict in the CDP. And uh, like that, uh, the government and uh, citizens, there, are, uh, there can be many kinds of relationships, conflicts of interest, information asymmetry. So the uh, government, uh, next, for the traditional uh, government citizens relationship, which uh, if we, we see the perspectives, traditionally it was black box. We, uh, we do, did not know the inside of the government. It was bureaucratic, hierarchical. They can see the citizens as constituencies or customers. There are vertical working systems and uh, slow responses. But if we uh, uh, take innovative attitude, we can disclose the real names of the policymakers. We can open data, the relationship between ministries and the, the government and citizens can be collaborative. <coughs> they can see citizens. Decision making can be flexible. Yeah, so they, they can respond to the risk signals in an agile manner. Because the reporting system can be flat. So the talented and highly experienced uh, high level officials can uh, sense the risk signals rapidly than the traditional government. Next. So the lower officials, higher officials, if they work collaboratively and communicate, cooperate, or if there is support, they can create more uh, efficient productivity and also they can respond to risks, risk signals effectively. So the change mindsets are required. Interdepartmental collaboration, the data sharing and the analysis are required. Yes. <clears throat> but even if we adopt digital government, people can see, <coughs> can be worried about the uh, related big broader worries they can have because the government can use sensitive data sharing 
they can look into their private behavior. So uh, to gain trust and support and buy-in of citizens, adequate public discourse and you are required is required. And uh, as the citizens are interested in their everyday lives, like part house, they should engage the citizens in those kind of policy matters uh, in the process of the policy making. Next. So for the effective governance, stakeholder engagement, open data, frequent communication, streamline the workflow, and monitoring feedback, this all kind of things are required. Next. Uh, the public sector cannot solve the problem alone. The private sector can have more resources, or they can have more highly developed technologies. People also, they can provide uh, wisdom. So they, if they collaborate together, they can respond to solution. They can come up with more creative solutions. Next. Uh, I just uh, introduced the curriculum on governance for the SDGs. Uh, UN DESA, uh, together with the uh, UNPOG, we has developed this toolkit. Uh, the governance yeah, aspect is very complex. So uh, for the trainers and the, the, for the public officials, we uh, created this toolkit uh, to better support the public service in their work. And uh, yeah, we, they can use in the uh, policy process in the field. We will uh, develop this training toolkit into online discourse and the handbooks also. Next. Uh, there are uh, 11, 11 or 10 or 11 kinds of uh, toolkits. Uh, as, you, as you see, it, it is uh, to promote critical understanding of sustainable development issues, enhance governance capacity, and strengthen someone's awareness of the active role. Next. Uh, yeah, this is uh, the explanation about the curriculum. Yeah. Next. Yeah, so government and the schools of public administration or institutions with training mandates, they can use this. And resident coordinators or UN agencies who are members of the United Nations uh, Public Administration Network and UN DESA, uh, when, they, when they can conduct uh, uh, workshops, they can use this toolkits very effectively. Uh, next. Uh, there are uh, the kinds of toolkits. Next. Uh, yeah, the, this curriculum was uh, created by the partnership between uh, UN institutions or uh, academia and other uh, uh, institutions. So the partnership agencies and institutions that are, you can see. Next. Uh, UNPOG led trained toolkits are three kinds, effective national to local toolkit, and the risk informed governance toolkit, and the social inclusion toolkit. Next. Yeah. That's all from my side. Thank you for your kind attention. I hand over the floor to Robin. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chin, for your wonderful presentation and uh, informative uh, knowledge about the public private people partnership, as well as the 11 principles and 62 strategies. Now we have the second session by Mr. Pravin Maharjan.
who is the uh, program management expert at UNPOG, DPIDG, and UNDESA. He has previously worked as an assistant manager in Koika, Nepal office. Mr. Pravin holds a master's and a doctoral degree in public administration administration from Yonsei University in Korea, and bachelor's degree in business studies from Tribuhan University. Please give him a big applause. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, I'll just, uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, just quickly go to uh, the next other my slide. So I'll start begin by saying that you know the global goals are uh, interconnected and and an action taken toward one goal. Uh, it supports or you know it can hinder uh, the achievement of others. So identifying and addressing these gaps uh, and the interconnection will help to build uh, a holistic systematic solution that amplify progress and minimize the negative impacts. So this one, action on goal 16 can positively contribute to all the goals. Uh, Okay, these are some of the topics uh, I will go through today, today's series. Um, so, do you know that uh, you know uh, there can be no sustainable development without peace, or no peace without sustainable development? So, <coughs> so, so this is a clear uh, acknowledgement that political goals must find a place alongside like social, economic, and um, environment one environmental ones. So, uh, you know, during the 20, uh, MDG implementation, uh, there were some gaps or challenges, especially on the absence of uh, recognition of the critical importance of governance as well as uh, institutional building. So to, uh, to swing that gap, uh, goal 16 emerged and it commits, uh, you know, countries to promote peaceful, inc inclusive societies for sustainable development and to provide um, access to justice for all and building effective, transparent and uh, inclusive institution at all level. So as you can see, this uh, slide is justice and strong institution. So which promote peaceful and inclusive success for sustainable development and promote, like I just mentioned, promote you know, access to justice at, and building in, inclu inclusive, transparent and uh, uh, in, uh, accountable institutions at all level. So uh, this 16 sets, uh, like there are 12 targets uh, for SDG 16. And uh, in addition to direct 12 targets within SDG 16, there are like 24 targets in other SDGs uh, that contribute to peace, uh, justice and inclusion. For example, uh, you can take uh, SDG 4, which is quality education. Uh, like target seven entails education for human rights and culture of culture of peace. These are some of the principles of SDG 16. Like uh, you know, it should be central to sustaining peace by strengthening institutions at all level. Uh, it should be free, active, and meaningful participation means uh, whole of society approach, leaving no one behind. And we must remember that uh, uh, all the vulnerable and marginalized citizens they are not the actors rather than they are beneficiaries. And uh, these are uh, three dimensions of SDG 16. The first one is strong institutions, uh, like uh, we need to build effective, accountable and transparent institutions. The second one is uh, building uh, peace to reduce all form of violence and other. And the third one is uh, justice. So which uh, focuses on anti-corruption and bribery 
and other uh, like rule of law and equal access to justice. So as you can see from the slide, the interlinkages with other SDGs, and it is also, uh, you know, the agenda also states that the interlinkages and integrated nature of SDGs are of uh, critical importance in ensuring that the purpose of new agenda is realized. So uh, I can just say put it like simply, none of the SDGs can fully realize on its own and the goals depend on each other. And uh, for this part, SDG 16 is reflected uh, to as an you know, enabling goal for all the uh, SDGs and uh, for achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And uh, here you can see the interlinkages with other SDGs, uh, like there is uh, economic sustainability, SDG 1, SDG 8, and other uh, social sustainability and environmental sustainability. So uh, progress on peace and you know, peace, justice, and inclusion target affect outcomes in other SDGs. And uh, like, if you take example, sometimes it is very obvious also uh, how peace or its absence affect economic growth, that is SDG 8. Or in other cases, you can also say the interlinkages or interaction may be less evident. For example, you know, how peace, justice, and um, inclusion affect ocean management, that is SDG 14. So uh, uh, in this slide, I wanted to say like, you know, explicit institutional acceptance of the importance of good governance and uh, peace for the achievement of sustainable development through the adaptation of goal 16 and references throughout the 2030 agenda outcome document, uh, you know, was an enormous breakthrough in the 2030 agenda. So uh, goal 16 underpins the other 16 SDGs all of his race and institutions that are capable of um, responding to the need of the public, trans public transparently and uh, accountably. Uh, so as you can see from this slide that uh, from the perspective of peace, and uh, so this graphic set out three elements of peace and identify the targets that contribute to each element. Let me go uh, through some elements. Uh, for example, element one, reducing all violences and promoting peace. It means uh, SDG 16 aims at developing and strengthening institutions to prevent violence and inequality. And if you go to next uh, element, it's uh, violence against and exploitation of women rights and youth as uh, youth. So when peaceful and inclusive societies uh, uh, are promoted along with effective institutions, uh, thus this create an enabling environment for public service to be delivered. And as we go to our next slide, uh, the justice part. So uh, this lack of access to justice impact, um, you know, the hardest on the lower income people or the marginalized people or the disadvantaged groups. So uh, building just societies contribute to preventing violence and conflict. And uh, this slide so far also three elements of just societies. So uh, for the like element four, rule of law and access to justice. Um, so ensuring that all people have legal identity, uh, secure protection mechanism, accelerates equal access to key uh, social services such as you know, health, uh, education, income generating opportunities, and so on. And uh, there is another element called, uh, you know, anti-discrimination and inequality. So this one, I want to quote uh, the 2019 SDG report, which uh, says that almost a third of the countries have legal gaps in the area of overarching and public life, like, uh, you know, constitutions, anti-discrimination uh, laws and so on. And over a quarter have legal gaps in the area of violence against women. And 29% uh, and 24% and of the countries have legal gaps in the employment and economic benefits areas and in like marriage and family areas respectively. So strengthening STG 16 can end this discrimination and uh, violence and promote equality uh, for all the people uh, 
uh, with the objective of leaving no one behind. And uh, this another element is illicit financing flows and corruption and bribery. So uh, just society is free of corruption and bribery with high level of trust in public institution can create significant uh, contribution to restricting or SDG target in economic domains such as uh, goal number eight, uh, decent you know, job creation for all the people. So, uh, and the last one is about the inclusion and you know, for the inclusion, the rationale for adopting institution more inclusive uh, hold that if more people perspective and experiences are taken into account in decision-making process that is participatory approach. Uh, development outcome will be shared across uh, all groups in society more broadly. And this uh, slide offer three elements of inclusive societies. And uh, the so the element seven is about access to public information and uh, <clears throat> protection of the media. It means uh, access to information held by public institutions that influence economic, social, and environmental sustainability is critical to monitoring and achieving all the SDGs. And uh, uh, meaningful participation requires institutional, constitutional, and uh, you know legal support. So, uh, and if you see like effective, accountable, and transparent institution at all level. So this is, uh, you know, decision making uh, and institution can help the effort against climate change uh, that detailed in SDG 13. Now I would like to uh, focus on SDG 16 on building effective, accountable and uh, inclusive institutions. So uh, this effective, accountable and inclusive institution are essential to achieve uh, the SDGs and this is recognized by SDG, especially by SDG 16 and the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And uh, these are, there are some uh, priorities or let's say, um, you know, things that we need to consider to build effective, uh, accountable and building uh, inclusive institutions. Like uh, it should be in the spirit of 2030 Agenda and as an you know, integral part of our efforts to leave no one behind reduce inequalities, uh, tackle environmental degradation, uh, promote uh, the well-being for all, and address other national and uh, local sustainable development priorities. So then how are we going to monitor and report the SDG 16? Uh, UN has uh, developed a guideline called a Voluntary National Review. It is a stock taking exercise to assist in implementation of the 2030 Agenda. So uh, this is a useful tool for member states to uh, track progress, uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions and to promote accountability. And uh, I forget to add one more slide here, one more point here. Now uh, cities, especially local uh, authorities, they are, uh, they are developing, not de they are publishing their uh, local reviews called voluntary local review. Uh, it was first started in New York City, I guess, and now it is expanding. And UN also uh, provide UN also developing the guidelines, as well as other uh, organizations are also, you know, providing guidelines for uh, publishing or for making the VLR. And but there are lots of challenges because uh, there there is no uniformity in the reporting SDG 16 in VNR. If you check the VNR report uh, that are uh, you know published or that are presented in high level political forum every year. Uh, the, there is no uniform in reporting. Some people, some member states report differently and some other member states, you know, differently. So there is a limited high level political ownership as well. And uh, so to get, to, to sink this uh, gap, uh, this global alliance uh, has developed a guide to report on SDG 16 in voluntary national review. If you want to check this report, uh, uh, we'll share this report in our uh, website as well. And uh, what are the current threats? Uh, so uh, at the global and regional level, there are impressive number of policy and legal frameworks and <clears throat> that are enabling the advancement of uh, peace and you know, justice as well as uh, 
the in inclusive institutions, transparent institutions and all. But its regional and national context is moving at a different pace. Uh, if you check, uh, you know, developed countries and uh, underdeveloped countries, uh, even in South, South, like South, Southern countries, these, uh, you know, development pace are very different. So there is a significant disconnect between the planning and development of accent plans. And uh, uh, also uh, there is a weak coordination among global, regional, national and local level. For example, there's a weak uh, coordination among the national uh, you know, government and local government as well. And another one is uh, you know, there is a lack of uh, this aggregate da da data and um, you know, that facilitate the identification of gap around key issues of corruption, uh, violence against women and youth and promotion of rule of law. To, uh, to, uh, to meet this uh, SDG 16 within the coming you know, nine, or nine years, or let's say by 2030, a set of key policy and programming are needed. For example, you know, implementing imp effective implementation. So SDG 16 will be challenging to meet by um, 2030 agenda, 2030 agenda, sorry. So what we need is a visionary and committed national leadership to accelerate progress on SDG 16. We also need uh, to make effective link between you know, justice, peace, and inclusion, and also you know, how we implement and monitoring mechanism of SDG 16 should be improved, and uh, it should be widely disseminated. And we are uh, like political and financial investment in SDG 16 data and statistics should be, you know, invested not only from the government side, from the uh, private sector, academia, and uh, you know, civil society organization, and all. And we also need whole of government approach uh, to ensure policy coherence in SDG implementation. As uh, mentioned by uh, Mr. Sim also in the beginning, we need very strong you know policy coherence in SDG implementation. So uh, national government should stress that they cannot tackle, you know, it's, it's obvious that national government cannot tackle the whole the SDGs or all the challenges alone. So what they need is whole of government approach to localize and achieving uh, the SDGs. So this would not uh, just like national government agencies uh, working on the you know, top level, we need uh, local government also to be engaged from the start, from the very beginning of the SDG implementation, SDG uh, prioritization, policy making, and all. Uh, not only whole of government approach, we also need whole of society approach. So, with a broad and meaningful engagement of all the you know consultation with stakeholders across all the uh, societies. Uh, so, like you know, multiple stakeholders, uh, academia, like uh, you know, universities, professors, CSOs, NGOs. A uh, youth group, religious group, and all. And for uh, measurement and monitoring of the SDG 16, uh, as I mentioned before, we need political and financial investment in SDG 16 data and statistics, uh, which is very important. And you know, we we also need to involve a broad range of uh, data producers to address to address the data gaps. Like uh, only government, national government cannot uh, address the data gaps. So we need uh, like I already said, you know, the private sector who are working on creating data or disseminating data. And uh, countries need to invest in data sources, like uh, they need to do, like, you know, mostly in, uh, in some countries they do census uh, once in a 10 year, but we need to do uh, this kind of, you know, uh, census or survey uh, more frequently to uh, understand the disparities uh, across population groups including vulnerable population group. And uh, so for the uh, you know, COVID-19, well, we also need to strengthen inclusive, accountable and responsive uh, uh, institutions to tackle COVID-19. So uh, whole of government and whole of society approaches, we need to tackle, uh, we need whole of government and whole of society approach to tackle this COVID-19. So uh, we need to implement a human right-based approach to data collection and uh, disaggregation to ensure that uh, no one is left behind as a result of the pandemic. And we also need to strengthen institutions that are accountable, inclusive, and uh, transparent. 
and invest sufficiently in national statistics officer, offices and national human rights institutions to enhance the quality of COVID-19 uh, statistics. And uh, these are some of the key recommendations. I will not go through all the uh, key recommendations. So I'll go through some of them, like uh, we need to increase political will at uh, global level, regional level, local level, and uh, national level to enable the effective and effic efficiency of the initiative that exists worldwide for uh, building strong institutions governed by principle of accountability and uh, effective governance. And to advance SDG 16 especially, it is key to increase the commitment to advance uh, and guarantee basic human rights, uh, such as you know, nationality, birth certificates, registration, identification of citizens. So these are uh, we need, and including you know, uh, youth, especially people with disabilities and those. And uh, so. These are three uh, transformative strategies I would like to put on table on uh, discussion, like, you know, prevent. So we need to invest in uh, prevention so that all societies and people reach their full potential. Uh, for the reform uh, renew, we need to transform institutions especially so they can meet aspiration for a more pros prosperous, inclusive and uh, sustainable future. And the last one is uh, involved. Uh, so include and empower people, not only government, not only uh, you know communities. The main uh, citizens should be involved so that they can fulfill their potential to work for a better future. I think I, I will end this uh, my presentation here. If you have any question, then uh, I'm happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Maharajan, for your wonderful presentation. And um, to keep you informed about our um, arrangement for the time, actually, we are approaching the time that we planned to finish up the class or this se session. But I would like to extend it by about 10 minutes to have a Q&A time for all of us, and then Actually, for the certification, your official measurement will be by 4.30 only. So 10 minutes extra for your Q&A. So please bear with us and uh, stay with us for all additional 10 minutes. Actually, we have many questions, but uh, to keep the questions and answers within 10 minutes, I guess we have to limit the questions of the two for each presenter. So first of all, we would like to uh, ask some questions from the floor to Mr. Shim. We'd like to invite Mr. Shim on the stage again. Okay, the first question is from uh, Ms. Angelica Perez from St. Paul University, Philippines. The question is, how does the UN plan to guide actors showing resistance towards incentives created to Could you answer the question, Mr. Shim? Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, there would be some, yeah, I think uh, uh, regist resistance was some uh, upload, uh, depending on the uh, uh, characters and their personality or their circumstances, uh, it can, be different, the response can be different. Uh, to ensure the uh, uh, implementation of the SDGs, uh, as we uh, said in, the, in our presentation, uh, we encourage the VNRs uh, every year. Uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, compulsory mandate, but uh, Many countries uh, voluntarily participate in VNRs, and also they share their uh, learnings and their experiences through the uh, VNRs. They can uh, apply a very uh, good technologies, uh, best practices to their peers. So 
uh, and also we provide, as I said, 11 prin principles of effective governance. Uh, and also we have developed uh, a curriculum uh, uh, to uh, train the public officials uh, what they can uh, make use of the trickies in the uh, field. Uh, and also we will develop in, into uh, online course and also handbooks we will develop. So uh, in the field, they can use, uh, it, it, it is just voluntary and there is no other capacity mandate, but uh, they, I think if they uh, take a look at those kind of things, uh, they can have uh, good lessons and good uh, on best practices uh, to apply in the field. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shim. And the um, following question is from Hachalo Daba from Ghana as an SNU student. His question is, what are your recommendations for emerging cities to follow as a strategy in utilizing the PPP public private people partnership for smart city planning. Could you answer the question? Yes, thank you. It's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> for the PPP, as I said in the final part of the govern effective governance uh, part, uh, the PPP is very uh, important in uh, creating uh, and uh, solutions and come uh, <clears throat> to the uh, issues raised uh, through, but they should be, there should be some open data uh, so the uh, other stakeholders can access the data. They can uh, make use of the data and then analyze the data they can uh, come up with uh, creative solutions through the data analysis. And also uh, the private sectors, they have, uh, can have uh, res uh, some resources and also they can have uh, state of the art uh, technology. Uh, so innovative technology, the private sector can uh, provide to the uh, public sector to tackle the wicked uh, issues. So <clears throat> uh, if they collaborate together, uh, they can solve the uh, very wicked issues and also come up with creative ideas. Uh, so the uh, uh, also the people, if they uh, participate together, uh, they can, uh, the private sector, the public sector can gain the trust of people through the engagement process. So uh, the PPP uh, can uh, create and harmonize very good atmosphere uh, for the uh, better solutions uh, to uh, implement the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shim for your very detailed and informative answer for those questions. Let's uh, invite uh, Mr. Maharajan again back on the stage for two questions for him. Here are two questions for you, Mr. Maharajan. The first one is from An Nguyen from Vietnam. So her question is, what policies or action plans do you have to strengthen public governance capacity and how to engage youth into these plans? It's a very uh, good question. So what policies or action uh, do you and has or do member states has or uh, it's not clear, right? So maybe our uh, UNPOC as a UN or I mean, as a UN as a whole, so it's not clear, but I will uh, just uh, answer with what I know from the UN perspective. So we need equitable and evidence-informed policymaking, the first one. We need uh, commit, uh, we need, let's see, uh, the leadership. 
uh, commitment, vision, and leadership. We need a uh, whole of government and whole of society coordination. Uh, in that whole of society coordination, youth can be involved uh, very actively. And we also need change management and innovation which means uh, public sector change management and innovation, like you know, introducing and implementing new ideas by reinforcing the strategic uh, agility and forward-looking nature of the state. In this one, young people are more advanced than you know, uh, the people who are born in 1980s or 70s. So youth can be involved in this kind of uh, innovation-related work. Another one is um, strategic planning. Uh, to articulate short, medium, and long-term objectives, and uh, you know, cluster policy initiative around a small number of integrated policy priorities. So for this one, uh, need skills for developing policies. Um, let's say that are um, combination of traditional aptitudes such as um, uh, the capacities of you know, for providing evidence-based uh, balance and objective advice with a new set of skill in digital, open and innovative government where young people can actively participate. And uh, also uh, the strategic use of policy in instrument, uh, so like especially digital government tools, a youth can be involved and policy maker, maker have to decide uh, which combination of policy in instrument, instruments can best be deployed to influence the contents and effect of policy action to address a problem. So uh, I think these are some of the uh, answer that I can uh, you know, concentrate on. And also for uh, you know, sound policy implementation also, we need to strengthen the capacities and skill of public employees uh, or young uh, public employees, let's say youth employees also to create a value-driven, trusted, and capable, uh, or like, you know, adaptive public services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Maharajan, for your answer to the question. Uh, second one for you is um, from Papua New Guinea by Russell Woruba, Department of Information and Communication Technology. So his question is, what models can we implement in digital government for its transformation in the public service to strengthen governance? Okay, this is a very good question and it is one of the work uh, UNPUZ is doing also. So uh, we need to develop a digital government strategy first, complemented by a plan of action and uh, impact assessment instrument. So uh, the strategy, the strategy should indicate, you know, expected outcome, uh, output, and impacts, and should be formulated with uh, involvement of public sector organization across all the sectors of government and consulting ex external stakeholders. So uh, we uh, we also need to invest on or continue to invest in the development of important key digital enablers like um, digital identity shared data service, shared business processes, and provide incentives for their use across the public sector. But we need to, uh, we need to be sure that uh, you know, privacy is secure, data privacy are like secure. And also uh, I would like to put like say, you know, focus on developing digital and data related skills in public sector and creating like uh, profiles and career based on forecasted needs and providing programs for training and retraining of civil servants. Another is uh, to promote and enforce the adaptation of uh, digital standards and guidelines to offer more coherent, uh, interoperable, and resilient digital government infrastructure like uh, you know, st standardized model of ICT project management. I think uh, Republic of Korea has that one and standardized model for business cases, service standard, and data interoperabilities. And uh, we need to also establish, um, let's say, integrated service design and uh, delivery policy to help public servants adopt user design. So it should be more of user design than, uh, you know, uh, like user design approaches from the beginning to end and develop service with a very agile, methodologies. 
the last one is also like we need to establish an open government data strategy, um, engaging external stakeholders with clear action to manage each of the data uh, value chain and support the you know the reuse of open government data for uh, value creation. I hope I answer your question. Uh, if you need more clarification, you can always reach to us uh, via email or the online discussion board that we uh, you know put in our uh, website. So we, you can always refer to that one, and we are happy to answer all the queries uh, you raise in the online discussion board. Thank you. That for your insightful answers for those questions. Um, for your information, all the presentation materials will be uploaded to UNPOG website, and the information shall be sent to everyone who registered into this session. So could you show the last page? Yes, as well, there is a post-event survey for session one. So you can use the QR code to access the survey page. And we hope that we can have lots of comments and uh, ideas for making this, the following sessions better. I wish you got lots of inspiration and ideas and knowledge for establishing your governments, your nations, your communities much stronger and resilient to achieve sustainable development goals. And we would like to continue this journey through the next nine coming sessions every Friday from 3 to 4.30 Korean Standard Time. And I wish you Boni, good night, and Jaizen. Have a good night. Thank you.